Thanks, Marcus. Uh, so, actually, my undergraduate degree was at the University of Southern Queensland. My, my PhD was at RMIT, which is far, far closer. Thanks a lot. So, this is um, it's a very interesting area. Uh, I think we learned from the discussions yesterday that this there are many aspects to this, and there are many uh, there are many parts, there are many issues, there are many elements. What I want to talk about today is uh, to briefly touch on three things. Firstly, who are we as technologists? And I apologise to those in the room who aren't technologists, but I'm speaking as a technologist. What do we know and what should we do? And those, I will touch on each of those very briefly. Uh, so what does it mean to be a professional? In the simplest sense, it means to be part of a group of experts who share some particular knowledge and responsibility and are held in esteem by the community. A professional may be a member of an organisation that validates that knowledge. That knowledge may be contested, so the organisation may be responsible for determining, determining what is truth and what is falsehood. For example, um, a medically proven or medically tested approach versus a, um, an approach without evidence. A professional will then gain measurable benefits and these could include uh, social prestige and financial reward. Professionalism can become self-defining. For example, we may say that a nurse is somebody who provides care to patients. Occasionally we read of a nurse who poisons their patients. But we don't then say that there is a continuum of nurses from those who care for their patients through to those who poison their patients. We say that the nurse who poisoned their patients was not really a nurse. Uh, for example, that they were deranged. So we say that the nursing profession as a whole cares for patients and those who may happen to be nurses who don't care for patients are outside of that profession. And in that sense, the profession uh, it becomes self-defining. Now, I'd like to compare that to politicians. Now, polit being a politician is not a profession. Being a politician is a result of an election. Now, a politician who accepts bribes is described as a corrupt politician. Their corruption doesn't exclude them from that group of politicians, even though their action is probably illegal. So if you compare politicians who aren't a profession to nurses who are a profession, we see a difference in, in uh, what professionalism is. Now, while younger than the archetypal professions of law and medicine, engineering, or more generally now termed technology, is nevertheless recognised as a profession in the 21st century. Uh, and this reflects the, res the responsibilities that we have in regard to technology. For example, we have a long history of concern for technology safety. Users of technology expect technologies not to harm them. Relevant, uh, and in that sense, our responsibility is similar to the responsibility of a doctor. Relevant training, perhaps registration by a government or membership of a technical professional association, uh, and experience through our careers will generally lead the technologist to expect the respect status and financial rewards related to the technology profession. Now, while critics may not agree with the truths held by a profession, uh, the fairness of access to a profession, uh, or the relative importance of various roles within a profession, by and large, my comments about a profession are not meant to be controversial. On the other hand, if we look at ethics within a profession, there are many points of uncertainty. And the ones that I want to address today sit in the relationship between professionalism, ethics, and technology standards. And specifically, I'll, I'll be speaking about the IEEE Standards Association. So IEEE Standards Association is part of a 420,000 member profession, global professional organization operating in 160 countries. The IEEE Standards Association is best known for standards such as Ethernet and Wi-Fi, and it has initiated the IEEE P7000 standard series, looking at ethics in autonomous and intelligent systems, generally known as AI. 
It has created an accreditation process so that in the coming months the first technical ethics standards will be available for accreditation. Specifically, I will be looking at the IEEE-led um, Global Initiative on Ethically Aligned Design and the subsequent IEEE Standards Association Industry Outreach Activity, Digital Inclusion, Identity, Trust and Agency. So, to start with, what is special about our role uh, in ethics and technology? Our role as in technologists' role. What is the specialist knowledge that technologists have with regard to technology? The common response could be, technologists know how technology works. Surely this is a reasonable assumption. Uh, if we invent and maintain technology, surely we must know how it works. As it turns out, this assumption is widely head held, but only true in a very narrow sense. So let's, let's start off with some ways that technologists do understand technology. And I'll give, I'll give three. So in the field in which we are trained and we work, we have a level of knowledge vastly beyond the general public and notably deeper than our colleagues in other technical, technical professional areas. Secondly, if we maintain a specific technology, then we are the subject matter expert. And uh, perhaps we provide, if we're in industry, we may provide third level support. If we're in academia, we, we may be highly cited. Um, we are the experts. Thirdly, and this is an extra one, that, uh, one that technologists will know from personal experience, through a general understanding of technical principles, we have an infuriating capacity to get faulty technology to cooperate, adding to the mystique around our expertise. And those technologists in the room who've been able to get a car working or a device going when the person beside them couldn't will know how infuriating that is for the person beside them. I don't consider this deep knowledge. I consider it accidental and, uh, and not particularly worthy of, uh, of proclaim. Uh, so what are the limits to our technical knowledge? And this is a much, lo this is a much longer list. There are several, and I'll, I'll list four, I'll put them in four categories. First, we don't know how a machine could be misused. We have tried to design the machine to make, it, uh, to make its misuse difficult, but human ingenuity is unbounded. Secondly, we don't know the social or economic impacts of a machine because that is not our field of expertise. We would have to speak to sociologists, ethnographers, economists and others to even learn of methodologies in which to consider those questions. Three, if the technology is relatively new, the science behind it may not have been worked out. So we look at the steam engine, which was developed through the 18th century through a process of trial and error. But it was only in the second half of the 19th century, that is well over, cent over a century after experiments began and some early production systems were, were available, that the laws of thermodynamics allowed an understanding beyond trial and error. Up until that point, if your bo boiler blew up, you simply thickened the steel. That was, that was the trial and error. Now fourthly, and this is the one that I find most interesting in these circumstances, if the machine is complex, we probably don't know exactly how it works. Take the analogy of the human body. While a doctor can keep track of major developments in understanding of the human body, reading the literature, their reputation is based on an ability to prevent or treat problems of the human body, not on their knowledge of how it works. Similarly, with technology, there are several reasons a technologist may not know how the technology works. Firstly, the technology processes are highly complicated, and it could take years or even multiple lifetimes for a single person working through the processes by which a machine determines a single decision. So in, in practice, you don't know how it works. In theory, you might be able to follow the, the million steps, but in practice, uh, nobody would ever be able to, no single individual would ever be able to follow those steps through. Secondly, when a machine gets, um, when a machine misperforms, it may do so in a way which is outside the previous experience of humans. 
uh, or beyond our psych the psychological operation of our mind to conceive. So no amount of testing could have revealed that, uh, that uncertainty. Thirdly, if the technology processes or inputs are non-deterministic, for example, if there are feedback loops in the system, so if we have a nice digital set of digital code, we have the situations I just described. If we have feedback loops uh, within the system, or is, if the system has analog inputs, that is in its learning processes, then the exact sequence of events that led to a decision may be unknowable in both a philosophical and a practical sense, as in the case of the human brain. If somebody says, exactly how did I come to that decision, neuroscience helps us, psychology helps us, but it doesn't give a definitive answer of what, what caused which synapses to operate in which order and to, to, uh, to come up with the result. And then, there's another one which I find interesting. In all cases, the future can never be known. We do not live in a mechanical universe. Cause and effect is a process for explaining what happened. It is not for categorically predicting what will happen. Cause and effect doesn't work like that way. Cause and effect doesn't work into the future. It explains the past. And so we can never be certain what a machine will do next. Now, so what do we do in the face of this uncertain knowledge? This innate incomprehensibility may be interpreted as a, as a refusal to take responsibility, to blame some black box, but that is not the, that's not what I'm suggesting. And I'll return to that in the conclusion. I suggest that in relation to technology and ethics, our greatest contribution is to make clear, that is technologists, to make clear the limits to comprehensibility of advanced technology and to work with ethicists, policymakers, regulators, and others seeking to manage this limitation. In this way, what we, what technologists don't know, don't understand about technology, is more relevant in the ethical context than the things that we do understand. So, how do we connect that, how do we connect codes of ethics and professional practice? For the past century, our uh, ethical responsibilities have been addressed through our endorsement of the Code of Ethics. So in, in the case of IEEE, it was adopted its first Code of Ethics around 1912. Um, it was the, and it was the first uh, professional association in the technology field to do so. I'm not going to suggest that we change that, that we, uh, that we reduce the importance of that code. Uh, at the simplest level, the IEEE Code of Ethics is designed as a guide for uh, professional practice. So the, go the code begins, I'm gonna, not going to read the entire code, although I'm happy to take questions on that. We, the members of the IEEE, in recognition of the importance of our technologies in affecting the quality of life throughout the world, and it's accepting a personal obligation to our profession as members and the communities we serve, to hereby commit ourselves to the highest ethical and professional conduct and degree. And then it follows by, it, it follows with, with uh, 10 of those, one of which is the paramountcy of, of uh, health, safety, and welfare of the public. Uh, and then avoiding conflict of interest, being realistic about claims, rejecting bribery, improving understanding, um, uh, maintaining our competence and admitting our limitations, um, honest criticism, fairly treating others, avoiding injury, and assisting our colleagues in following this, this code. So that's, I'll just summarize that very quickly. This code is a living document. In 2017, for example, in response to a 2016 report by AI Now, uh, an excellent report if people haven't read it, um, the, which called for IEEE and other organizations to address AI by updating their codes of ethics, uh, we updated, we, we developed a further addition to the code for the first time ever including a technology in our code of ethics and that is a reference to intelligent systems. And that reflects the fundamentally different character of AI compared to all preceding technologies. Because with AI, the AI has the ability to then create something further and that's the difference. So the order of magnitude, so previously the Unexpected consequences from what we do is large, and now we have unexpected consequences from all the things that the AI creates. It's a, so it's an order of magnitude, or many orders of magnitude greater. 
than our modern AI technologies. Before going in further into what we should do, I want to mention a current discussion in the field of ethics in relation to law and ethics, or more specifically legal obligations and ethical obligations. We can think of these two obligations as coming from two uh, separate philosophical uh, assumptions. The first is the Hobbesian view that society needs to be controlled. Now, regardless of one's view of Hobbes' 18, uh, sorry, 1651 approach in Leviathan, uh, which he illustrates through references to the alleged barbarity of traditional American Indian communities, about whom he knew nothing, uh, the value of legal sanctions in modern capitalist society is widely, if not universally, accepted. Most people would want the police person to stop the other, the assailant beating you up. Um, so one could actually say that Hobbes created the society which needed uh, the control that he described. Uh, human rights which are incorporated in law provide a protection, for example, the requirement of companies to provide services to people with disabilities. From a human rights perspective, we can begin with, uh, with Immanuel Kant's uh, 1785 exhortation. So act that you use humanity in your own person, as well as in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. People are never a means. People are always an end. All people, is what he said. Kant's focus on beauty is well suited to the approach of professional responsibility. But the point here is, we must not make legal human rights obligations a nice to have dependent on the sense of duty of a corporate or government organisation. And that we have to appreciate that, that ethics, ethics as a something which draws on the person should not replace legal responsibility which says you don't discriminate and other such things. So the Code of Ethics uh, is an individual undertaking by IEEE members. How does that translate into the design of technology? For IEEE, the primary activity here has been undertaken by the IEEE Standards Association. This commenced in uh, 2016 when a group of uh, around 75 people prepared, prepared the first draft of ethically aligned design. The following year, some 250 people participated in writing a second draft. After these two versions, in March this year, the first edition, uh, by which a time it came out, by which time more than 2,000 people had been engaged in the preparation process. As work on the document proceeded, activity also occurred on other fronts. The, uh, particularly the initiation of the IEEE P7000 series of uh, standards working groups on ethics and AI. There are currently 15 of these groups. Uh, with the first due to complete their work around the end of this year. IEEE's ethically, uh, sorry, Ethics Certification Program for Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, BCPAIS, has also been developing metrics uh, and processes which will implement a certification methodology addressing transparency, accountability and algorithmic bias. So all of that work has been happening over the last uh, few years. The standards working groups are addressing key principles and issues identified in ethically aligned design, the document. These include uh, process modelling, P7000, transparency, 7001, um, uh, personal data, 7002, algorith algorithmic bias, 7003, student and child data, 7004, employer data, uh, 2005, uh, 7005, Personal Data AI Agents, 7006. The Standard for Ethically Driven Robots and Automation Systems, 7007. Uh, nudging, um, which includes overt or hidden suggestions or manipulation, 7008. Fail Safe Design, 7009. Uh, metrics for Wellbeing, 7010. So in addition to those 11 groups, from 00 to 10, uh, the IEEE Society on Social Implications of Technology, SSIT, which Marcus referred to, is now working on four standards in the series. Uh, so P7011 looks at uh, trustworth trustworthiness of news uh, through a, a rating process. Uh, machine readable privacy terms, P7012, uh, led by Doc Searles, is looking uh, at addressing the problem of how do we represent ourselves in negotiation with organisations. 
7,013 is looking at facial uh, recognition technology, and that's particularly important in relation to the current Australian bill on facial recognition, which is absolutely not ready for, um, for um, law. Uh, and there's a public discussion about it. It's just happening at the moment. Talk to me if you want to be uh, part of SSIT's response to that. And then the, the, last, uh, the last one in that series is uh, emulated empathy, looking at uh, robots which uh, show, which play on it, more, which work with emotions and cognitive states. So these are, all, these are all standards and you can see each of them has a, a strong ethical aspect. In addition to this wide-ranging work, IEEE Standards Association has initiated the Open Community for Ethics in Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, Oceanus, which is essentially a group of standards organisations and standards interested organisations around the world uh, looking at uh, standards in autonomous and intelligent systems. The, um, I'll just briefly run through the work that Digital Inclusion Through Trust and Agency or the challenges we're looking at and these, this is what are the barriers to people accessing the internet or accessing an online uh, experience? Uh, and some of the challenges that we're dealing with, this is not just availability and affordability. Uh, some of the questions such as quality of uh, 5G service in a village. Um, the ability to stream high speed uh, video to a high speed train is an expensive and challenging feature of 5G, but it isn't required in a village because you're in a village, you're not sitting on a train, moving at high speed. If you take that requirement out, you significantly reduce the cost of the 5G service, the chips on the 5G service. So we're looking at things like that. It's not reducing functionality, but reducing stuff that doesn't actually contribute. Um, in village communities, the female empowerment is a key need, and the most important training question has turned out to be, how do I le delete my browsing history? Uh, we have the, uh, we've developed a webinar, or we produced a webinar on IoT and domestic abuse. Uh, this is particularly using uh, air conditioning system, uh, abuse of air conditioning system control and, and control over security. And the two recommendations that came out of that were the ability of local people in a house to over over override remote instructions to IoT enabled devices and a record kept of all remote access to those IoT devices. So you can, the person is trying to, trying to convince you you're crazy, you can prove that they actually access the thing and can hunt around with the security or the heating in the home. Um, in the, a couple of other, uh, we held a workshop on uh, ethical challenges of AI devices in the homes of the intellectually disabled. Uh, we did that in Sydney late last year, uh, which, was, which was a really, really good um, workshop and uh, even if the organisation we were working with wasn't happy with the limitations of their project which we identified um, and in areas of identity we're looking not just at agency, a person agreeing to something but dignity, what should we ask the person to agree to uh, in online gaming over trying to bring some of the offline practices to, uh, of um, social norms to limit, uh, to curtail antisocial behaviour online in gaming. Um, so if you are interested in any of those, please, please contact me. Now to summarise, and I miscalculated my time a little bit, professional technologists have a professional duty to act in an ethical way. This is both personally and through our contribution to the ethical actions of the organisations we work in, their products and services. This is widely accepted. I have never met a technologist who boasted about how much money they made from a failed project or celebrated a profitable but dangerous product. I know some companies have done that, but not the technologists. What is more difficult is understanding how to, how to undertake that ethical behaviour in real life challenges. Is the technologist meant to sacrifice all when faced with an ethical challenge? Uh, now, I think Marcus is speaking later about uh, whistleblowing, so I won't, I won't go further on that. I'm speaking here about a different uh, responsibility. To be honest in acknowledging our areas of weakness, uh, to quote the Code of Ethics, Archibald Code of Ethics, full disclosure of pertinent limitations uh, in relation to AI. I mentioned black boxes. As a technology, particularly AI becomes more complex, most of what we will know 
uh, will come from the product behavior. That is, they will appear increasingly opaque, especially when we have AI designing AI. A device with inputs and outputs. We can and should ask the AI to explain its decisions, and you will have read many references to that, but we have to expect that the answer we get from the AI explaining its decision will be the answer that satisfies us, not the true answer. <coughs> For an AI, that would be problem optimization, not deliberate cheating. But just as a doctor is expected to treat a patient, even though they don't know exactly how the person works, technologists should still be expected to take appropriate precautions to prevent poor or actively bad outcomes. This is the key contribution which we can make to the ethics debate today. Now, the field of ethics is, is growing, not just because many people are jumping on the bandwagon, but because the challenge of AI, challenges of AI are significantly different to those of other simpler technologies. I'll finish with a question, which is sort of like to the side of what I've spoken about, but it's a question I'm interested in, and it's a question that definitely relates to ethics. AI technologies are expected to significantly change the face of employment in the coming decades. Does a technologist working on an AI application, which they confidently expect to replace jobs of many people, have an obligation to those people whose jobs they expect to replace. Thanks. Do you want us to answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Uh, one is that the SSIT part of the IEEE has demonstrated in Greg's speech that the necessity for a social impact of technology component of technology organisations is amply and fully verified. And they started reacting before the public started. We need to recognize that both in technology and in humanities, that the bridges must be built in both directions. At the moment, technology is taking the lead. Currently, the humanities is lagging. So we have time for two questions. So would people put up their votes?